The Return of the Sith, equals RK equals, Prologue, Safe House, Coruscant. The man known as Alien Gray sat in front of his computer terminal and wondered how to best describe the situation across the galaxy. His official job was that of an informational broker. He had agents all across the galaxy, contacts within multiple intelligence agencies, friends in the Senate, a lot of them too. Gray had access to unparalleled amount of raw data. He could get his hands to ours, intelligence summaries and much more. None of that really prepared him for the events of the last few weeks. Gray believed he knew what was coming. He prepared to use those events to further the Vong cause. Instead he was caught off guard by everything going to hell so fast it was hard to believe. Where should he start? Perhaps with Vale's impossible arrival from the past? Or that of his enemies, the Old Republic remnant? His superiors were fascinated with the Force and the warriors who wielded it. They and their effect would play a prominent part in his report. Still that didn't help him begin writing it. In order to explain how the whole galaxy was thrown in utter chaos, Gray had to explain the events leading to the current situation and that was problematic. Did someone plan this? Was the war itself to blame? Despite all the information he had, Gray didn't have good answer to those questions. Well, there were the facts. The ORR arrived a few years ago, didn't like what they found so they infiltrated the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Their plan was obvious in hindsight, make a war between the Republic and CIS inevitable, then escalate it until the only viable resolution was a military victory. Then ensure that both the Republic itself and the Sith who originally engineered the war were gone. That at least was Gray's conclusion when he analyzed the data. Of course, officially the ORR were allies to the Sith and fought to save the galaxy from the Sith. It was unknown if they engineered the coup withing the Confederacy which removed Dooku from power so they could safely reveal themselves or if they stood up only after the Sith was removed. Gray had conflicting data on that point. Of course, one couldn't think about the Sith without Vale jumping to the front of their mind. A Sith from long forgotten age. A competent general who joined the war on the Republic side and if you trust most of the data Gray had, almost single-handedly ensured that the Confederacy didn't win the war during the first year of the conflict. Ryloth. Second Geonosis. Gerontham. Iriadu. Four battles which made the man a legend. Then there were. Atrizia and Camino, two worlds who he killed. Many loathed him for the first, while other defended his actions in stopping a horror worthy of the Shapers themselves. Camino was different. There was no independent confirmation, just Confederate claims which many dismissed as propaganda. Vale wasn't available to comment, the man was either dead or on the run with the Republic fleet which fled Camino after burning that world. The Sis certainly believed in the later option and was hunting him. The Republic on the other hand was numb. The news that Vale might have gone rogue came on top of many hammer blows. Most of the galaxy was under the nominal control of the Confederacy. The Karelian system was in separatist hands with four of the five brothers invaded and two conquered. As if that wasn't bad enough, the Jedi rebelled and attempted to carry out a coup under the pretense of protecting the Republic from the Sith. They managed to assassinate Chancellor Palpatine and put the highest-ranking Gar officers on Coruscant either in the hospital or the grave. In retaliation, the Republic Army stormed the Jedi Temple and the surviving Jedi were now on the run. Gray smiled. Of course they ran. After all, with his dying breath, Chancellor Palpatine issued Order 66 and thus crushed one of the biggest obstacles for the Vong conquest. The Republic was in turmoil. It was besieged by the Separatists and weakened by treason. Oni and Sib were under investigation because some of their agents and even the former's director took part in the coup. The Senate was paralyzed by clashing agendas and the stunning treason of the Cathar and their allies who not only seceded after the coup failed but formally joined the Confederacy a few days ago. The CIS on the other hand was busy digesting and securing its new gains while trying to deal with hostile populations across the breadth of the galaxy. Their offensive in the East Quadrants was still ongoing, while in the West multiple sectors led by Ariadu continued to resist. Grey sighed. How exactly was he supposed to make a proper report of that utter mess? Equals RK equals. The mother machine. Location classified. Bell Savis. Well, this is certainly unexpected. I grumbled. The entrance to the mother machine was buried when I landed. It took two days for combat engineers working around the clock to clear the way to the chamber where my salvation was supposed to wait. 
The place was a bloody wreck chock full with the mummified remains of old Republic troopers, Jedi and what suspiciously looked of clones based on me. The whole place was dark and there was no trace of power. Get generators set up and running. I pointed at the machine itself. I needed operational yesterday. My time was running out. Even with the best alchemy concoctions I could brew, my body was giving up. I had a day, perhaps two left before I died. Vatal began using Shark T's body as a meat puppet. I glared back at the mother machine. The damn thing looked quite banged up. Even with power restored there was no guarantee that it would be operational. I went to the closest Jedi body and kicked the bastard. The bloody mummy crumbled into dust. Criffing Jedi. Even in death they were trying to do me in. Interlude. Sweet dreams. Bridge. Imperial cruiser Ravager. High orbit over Hoth. Why you ask? I smiled. Yes. Why do you serve the Empire? The Sith? Ashara repeated her question. Why do you condone this? The Jedi Knight waved at all the ships gathered outside. As we speak, the Empire your kind loves to loathe, feeds, clothes and protects trillions. There are countless people living upon thousands of worlds who haven't seen one of our soldiers outside a parade or a holovid. Day after day, year after year, our people live their lives in stability and security provided by the Empire. I explained. You're a Sith. Ashara snorted. Do you honestly think I would believe such a lie? I turned around to face her. A lie? Ah, Jedi. So easy to rile up. The emotions I could sense coming from the Togruta were quite amusing. All that sweet indignation spiced up with a hint of anger. On a thousand worlds random people run afoul of Sith. They get humiliated, injured, tortured or killed. Perhaps all of the above if it suits someone's fancy. I shrugged. A spark of triumph appeared in Ashara's eyes. Then why do you support such evil? She glared at me. Support it? I chuckled. Of course I support it. I've spent decades cleaning up the mess's Sith cause. The Jedi stared at me in confusion. You're mad. She shook her pretty head in exasperation. I merely view the world from different perspective. For the record, the term's differently rational. I quipped. The Sith gave me strength. When I was merely a wretched slave, they gave me the opportunity to better my position. To claw my way up into relevance as I earned strength. They gave me the tools to overcome any challenge. I broke my chains, Jedi. I'm free to forge my own path. And you chose to waste that freedom. Ashara glared at me. Am I? I glared back. I've done more for the people of this galaxy as a part of the Empire than any ten Jedi combined, I snapped. How many deranged Sith have you put down, Ashara? I asked lightly. The sudden change of topic took her aback. Ten, twenty? I continued. Twelve. You'll be lucky number thirteen. The Jedi snarked. I lost count while I was a mere acolyte. Let me tell you a dirty little secret, Ashara. The two empires I described, they both exist. I know that we Sith are flawed creatures. We built this empire. We're its greatest strength yet the one thing which could tear it apart. Your monsters. Ashara's glare didn't abate. I've seen your handiwork, broken people, families torn apart, whole worlds put to the torch. And why? For vengeance? To satisfy your insane lust for conquest? True enough. I admitted lightly. What of it? You prove my point, Ashara declared as if she just scored a victory. Jedi, I exclaimed. Every time I think you've grown up, that you might finally understand, one of your kind proves me wrong, I sighed. With a gusto. Ashara huffed. Whatever she expected me to do, this wasn't it. Grow up? She chuckled. From where I'm standing it's you Sith who refuse to grow up and set the galaxy on fire with your temper tantrums. To tell the truth, I know some Sith who are exactly like that. I've killed my share of the bastards too, I agreed, making her frown. It doesn't make my point any less valid, Jedi. You have a point? A look of mock confusion appeared on Ashara's face. To answer your question, power. I shot back. Which question? This time the confusion on her face was genuine. Yes. I smirked. All of them. Power is what we seek, Ashara. Power so we would never again be weak. Power so we won't be hunted down like rabid animals by you and your wretched republic. Power enough not to be brought to the edge of extinction again. I looked her in the eyes. 
Power over this whole galaxy. Power over our rivals, you Jedi. Power to be victorious against everyone and everything the universe could throw at us. Power enough to set us free. That's it? You started the Great War because you were afraid? Ashara scoffed. That's insane. She trailed off when I glared balefully at her. Is it? What would have your kind done if we didn't strike first? What would your precious Republic have done if the Empire simply revealed itself as a rival? What would have you done when you discovered that the people you tried to exterminate on Korriban all those centuries ago were back? Ashara opened her mouth to retort, but paused. Her nose scrunched cutely when she began thinking. We're different than you, Jedi. There's power in vengeance. In conflict. Is that drivel meant to seduce me to the dark side? Ashara scoffed. Not really. We're chatting to pass the time. I looked over Ashara. I won't mind seducing you thought. In your dreams. The Jedi snorted softly. You might be. If you wore something more flattering than those fur-covered robes. Sir, we've lost contact with the port hangar. No alarms. So our guests have finally arrived. Splendid. I clapped cheerfully. Ashara narrowed her eyes at me. My friends will save me, she declared. That look of utter conviction suited her. Save you? I inquired. From what? I asked curiously. The Jedi went back to glaring pointedly in my direction. You aren't in the brig, Ashara. I see no shackles on your hands or feet. No slave collar around your pretty neck. You're my guest. I cheerfully pointed out. A look of dawning comprehension and horror appeared on her face. Jedi attacking my flagship after I went to all that trouble to retrieve you from those maniacs back on Hoth. Why, that's an act of war, my dear. A war nor republic neither the Empire want at this time. This was all a trap, Ashara hissed. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even try to hide my amusement. Equals RK equals. Mother machine chamber. Bell Savis. My eyes snapped open and my dream vanished like a mirage on the wind. I felt. Relaxed. At peace. I could feel the terminless currents of the Force, which were passing through me like a bubbling spring tainted by the dark side. Procedure complete, Asha declared in passionless voice. Original template restored. Power reserves critical. Shunting all available power to self-repair protocols. I used my power to open the chamber where I my body was rebuilt and jumped out, landing lightly on my feet. I was weird. The force felt sharper, clearer now that I was back in my original body, or the closest I could ever get to that state. General, all you will write? One of the doctors waiting for me asked. I feel great. I smiled. Once I get myself in some clothes you can scan away to your heart's content. I added. Damn, the place felt cool. I glanced back at Asha. The mother machine had shut down and was busy siphoning energy to repair itself. While it lacked the capability to give me back the enhanced body it made for me all those millennia ago, after a quick repair cycle she was able to restore my original body from a template it kept for all those years. It was a very close thing. I'm pretty sure the Force had her grubby fingers in this outcome, because if it took Asha even a few more minutes to restore itself to basic functionality I would have went for plan B. This was an answer. Equals RK equals. My eyes snapped open and I wheezed, gasping for breath. A wave of dizziness hit me, preventing me from making sense of my surroundings, until someone pressed an injector to my neck and I felt the soothing warmth of stimulants flooding my system. Asked, was that a dream? An unusually clear force vision? I sighed as my mind began clearing. The first part, I remember that conversation with Ashara. We met for the first time earlier that day. As far as the other part of the dream, well my weakness was good enough proof that my body wasn't fixed. Thank you, doctor. I intoned quietly. Don't. Freedom CMO glared at me. Everything I know about medicine and human biology tells me you should be dead. The elderly woman snapped. Her green eyes glared at me as if I was an affront to science itself. I'm a Sith, Doctor. We're made of sterner stuff, I chuckled and it hurt. Really? A thin eyebrow went up, then she pocked me in the chest hard enough to make me fall back on the cot where I've been dozing off. Sterner stuff. Right. Your bedside manners suck. My patients suck. She countered. What's the status of the machine? I asked after finally sitting up. 
It took three tries until the stimulants finally kicked in and returned a bit of strength to my ravaged body. It's still sucking in all the energy it could. No change otherwise. You're out of time, General. I know. Have the prisoner brought down here. It looks like plan B after all, I sighed. This would complicate things. Still, it beats dying in his hole. AN1, to preempt a few questions, the interlude above is Delcatar dreaming of the past, followed by dreaming of what he hopes to happen as the title suggest. The last part is Vale being awake and afraid that his body is going to fail before the mother machine could be repaired. What happens on Belsavis will be revealed after a few updates covering events on Coruscant. AN2, this short story is by Pef on the Space Battles forums, posted with his slash her permission. Equals RK equals. Interlude Pef's Corporate Misadventures I. Equals RK equals. Planet Farana. Corporate Sector World. Very newly settled. Don't mind the natives. Wake up Pef, school starts soon I heard my mom yell while passing beside my door. Bantha poo. Gah. Living in Star Wars was not the adventure I was hoping for. See new worlds, meet new people they said. Right. A crappy apartment in a crappy town on a crappy planet. In the armpit of the galaxy called Corporate Sector. Visit Bernadin, the sector capital. Experience the velvet pleasures of a thousand worlds, in a single place. Ha. Huh. Damn commercials. If I found a job, if I worked hard to pay the school debt, if I saved all my credits in my potential future job for 10 years, then I could buy a ticket to Bernadin and stay in a hotel for a week. Or visit a pleasure resort for one day. It's not exactly slavery, but not much above it. I willed the door to close and started my mantra again. The force is with me, and I am with the force. My strength is my own. I will not break. The force will set me free, one day. I wish I knew the right words. Yay, right. I sighed and opened my eyes. Today was sector administration and the bureaucracy lessons. You can do it Pef. One more year and school is over. Then you can climb the corporate ladder, and be a model citizen. I mused to myself, then rose and went on my morning routine, washing and all. I checked myself, uniform tight and proper, corporate ID, a cred chip for lunch. I will survive. Then I walked out of my room and stepped in the wonderful Disney world of Star Wars. Only with less lasers and much more hard work. Take the pills Peth. And please try not to beat up more kids my mom said, pointing a finger at the glass with blue bantha milk. Right. Dopamine and adrenaline suppressions. With half a liter of bantha milk. The news were on, going about militarization costs and the Camino event. The galactic events played out much like in my memory the fall of the Republic, Order 66, Jedi massacred, and a few more things, which the nice Rob didn't care to elaborate on when it brought me here. Glad I was able to avoid all that. My parents were educated people not bantha farmers letting some Jedi steal their kid. Love you too I told mum, and walked out. Weather outside was still the constant 20 degrees, with mild winds and programmed rainfall at night. Curtosy of some corporate weather satellites and tax breaks for planetary settlement. Same old. Let's see. The train comes in 12 minutes, it takes me 6 minutes to reach the station if I walk, 3 minutes if I ran. Walk it is. No need to bother corporate security with me running without reason. I reached the station just as my nemesis did, of course. The rich girl with important parents. Smile Pef. Don't break her nose. Again we are not five-year-olds. You don't want her doll. She hasn't broke your toys in the last few years. Not intentionally. If it isn't Peth, the school prodigy she said, smiling angelically at me. I smiled back, carefully not checking her out. Good morning Miss Kuid. Taking the train with the peasants again? I asked curious. Why did she do this? I was certain her family had entire spaceships ready to take her anywhere. Except Kuid itself. The system was under siege by now. But of course. How can I rule the masses if I don't know how they live and think? She replied elegantly and checked the time on her last model of datapad. I looked around. Two security bots and a few Kuit mercs on the train platform, idling around for no reason. Mere coincidence. Yes, how stupid of me. Glad to know our future masters have their citizens in mind I replied politely, and not clenched my fists at all. Not even once. 
A few oxynons stepped closer, their black pupilless eyes giving me the creeps as always. Right, the train was coming. The girl stepped closer to me, and hooked her arm in my elbow crook. I am in your care, my knight. See me safely to school? She asked, smiling again. Sure. Why not? The mag train came and we bunched up inside, along with a million other people. The girl smelled nice, and her skin felt very soft. Especially the softer parts. She must be doing this on purpose. There's no rational way to go about it. So, sector administration A? Eh? Today is gonna be fun I told her amused, and pushed a native away. The train was packed, but not that packed. The test will be easy. For prodigies she answered, somehow managing to step even closer to me. Way too close. Wait, the test? Not again. I swear she bribed the teachers somehow. I grumbled nervously, trying to figure out which lessons will be tested. You didn't know? A, eh? the articles of incorporation should be easy enough she joked, fanning herself with her free hand. Very posh. Damn it. I'll have to drain some brains again. Can't have my grades drop even one point. I have to be first. School first, then a job interview. Any corporation but Kuwait. The train shook, and came to a stop. Power failure. That was strange. Public transportation was hooked in the planetary grid. Fusion reactors, protected by theater shields. They wouldn't just fail. A flash of light, beyond the atmosphere. Then more and more. Damn it. The Clone Wars have arrived. Equals Ash hey equals. Interlude Pef. Planet Farana. Corporate Sector World slash Zinch, disputed. The girl's eyes narrowed as she listened to some short bursts of panicked voices in her ear com. I was just glad my emotions were subdued, fancy drugs or not. Wouldn't do to lose control just now. I just closed my eyes and opened to the force. Zinch Empire trying to retake the planet, counting on sector fleets being massed elsewhere. Forty assault vessels, twenty-two frigates, one battleship. Lucree Huke class, the donut shape easily recognizable in the force, even at this distance. The planetary forces were fucked. Fighters were dying out there, pings of pain echoing in the force. A larger wave of pain came from somewhere north, most likely another theater. A uh, shield failing. Along with its engineers and garrison. We need to get of this rock we spoke in concert, like a weird echo. I blinked once, and my fingers twitched, imagining myself piloting a fighter into the command sphere and blowing up a reactor P. Alone in the command core. Right, as if. I was not the chosen one. Let's go I said, dragging the girl after me, and punching the plus glass window with my credit chip. The window exploded outwards, and I jumped, the force enveloping us both in a protective shield. The chip was broke too, but at least it did the job best ten credits ever spent. We ran, as the first ship started breaking through the atmosphere, and death's echoes climbed in an ever-increasing crescendo, somewhere in the back of my brain. The starboard is the other way, Clarice yelled, pointing at the obvious trap. I know. And they know too I yelled back, heading towards the first parking lot I saw. Let's see, truck Chan, van Chan, bike Chan. I climbed onto one and let the force guide my fingers, opening the sick pad and typing a random string of numbers. Being calm helped too. It even worked. Random accidents were the last thing with the force. Operator, I need hoverbike piloting skills. I recited in my mind as the G-forces took over and we took off at high speed. You can drive? The girl yelled in my ear. Of course, I yelled back. Now, if only I could remember how to stop. A feeling of peace took over, my motions certain, my destination in range. Smuggler port, 32 case east. About 10 minutes then. Have your people secure my family, then go dark. We'll come back with a fleet I told Clarice, my voice steady. Her grip became tighter for a second, then she started barking orders in her com. She felt scared yet confident. Not a coincidence at all then. The smugglers were preparing to flee as well. Crates being loaded up on their freighter. A droidica began unpacking as we came into its sensor range. Damn things were everywhere, I swear. Oh well, at least I found a way to break. Hold tight, I yelled, and jumped, guiding our fall behind the droid, 
then bringing the force up to shield us from the impact with the ground and the explosion behind us. One, two, three. I waited for the plasma gases to dissipate, then jumped again, landing on the ship's plank. A jebrook, a human, a couple of oxynons. I dived under the blast of fire, grabbed the knife handle from the jebrook's belt, and let the force do the rest. Six seconds, six kills. Damn. I was wiped. My knees bent and I fell, the metal reverberating strangely. Oh. My knees. Peff. Are you injured? The girl cried, running towards the ship's plank. Just tired, take us out of the atmosphere then turn off everything. I muttered as she reached me. We'll be sitting ducks. Why would we do that? She asked curious, as she carried me towards the cockpit, and threw me into a seat. I wanted to explain but, sleep. That sounded as a good idea. Orbital mechanics will take care of the rest. I woke up much later, the girl wrapped around me, along with a few thermal blankets, and tied herself to my chair. Well, I did say everything, so she turned of life support and gravity as well. She was trembling too. I flicked the Navin life support back on, and checked the screens. Farana kept falling around the sun, the blockade fleet locked in geosynchronous orbit. 8 towers at 34 k's per second. Over 250,000 k's already. We'll need to be a million k's farther, before we could engage the engines undetected. More sleep sounded good. Equals Ash hey equals. Interlude PEF. Planet Farana. Corporate Sector World slash Zinsch, disputed. The smell of synth calf woke me, alerting my Pavlovian instincts. And I didn't even drink the bantha poo. I mean, not in this life. This life, I drank milk and anger management pills. Did Kuit got wind of my psychotherapist? Did they read my files? Privacy laws were mere suggestions in the corporate sector. And if they got wind of that, what else did they know? Miralu Khan self-defense course? My search logs on the Holonit? Contrary to what someone might expect, the galaxy was quite silent about force teachings. Almost like someone was erasing every single trace of them. I checked the nav screen, grav well estimations folding the system map like bowling balls on a trampoline. Farana was still too close, not for a standard jump, but for a silent one. Fuel range at hyperdrive 2.0, on board consumables. One month for six adults, three months for two people, maybe four months, if we were careful. Steam coming from the shower. Make that three months then. Clarice wouldn't know how to ration. The Hidian Way super route was marked in black and ship's nav. Right, smugglers wouldn't use that. Too many taxing polities. 18 red routes, and 14 yellow routes. One route was preloaded, though I was not gonna use it. Not with a female companion. Heart space was nasty. Would going to Benandon help anyway? Probably not. Even a Kuwait affiliate would have trouble extracting help from the Mega Barons. And Clarice was not of age anyway. She didn't have corporate votes, or a private fleet. And as the Kuwait mandate has retreated to defend Kuwait, so did their influence. She's be at best a hostage, and at worst a negotiating chip. What was that veil doing? Damn Sith Lords. Blowing up planets, no matter which continuity. Pef, are you awake? Clarice asked, entering the cockpit, skin still wet and wearing a towel like a toga. I was awake now. Too awake. The force is with me I replied, closing my eyes. Dan, now he's a Jedi. She muttered, then turned around and left. More games. You wouldn't like to show you my other side. And going by the migraines forming in the back of my eyes, she will find out soon enough. No more drugs. How long are we gonna drift here? She yelled, partly muffled by some texture. At least twelve hours. What's for lunch? I yelled back. Silence. Right, high class girl, no menial droids around. She would starve next to a box full with food. Or she'd eat me first, then starve. Don't underestimate corporate hunger. I sighed and went to prepare some lunch. Galley was full, lucky for me. Two mixes, cereals and eggs wrapped in synth sugar and two glasses of bantha milk. Lunch of the champions. She sat next to me and ate without complaining. At least she was polite. This food is kinda crappy she commented, wiping the corner of her mouth delicately. Food in refugee camps would be much worse. I didn't say anything, 
Of course. This was exactly the crappy food I ate at home. Couldn't praise it now, could I? At least it wasn't sea cow milk, fresh from the source. Your family left you to die. Or at least fend for yourself. They knew Farana will fall I said, eyeing her with calm eyes. She looked down, and stayed silent. Kuid will survive, don't worry. Worst case, someone else will pay for the ships I continued, raising and heading towards the cargo hold. Corellian freighters, C1, you seen them all. I started taking inventory, ignoring the dead bodies at the entrance. Droid parts, electronics, missile parts, more electronics, blaster parts, more electronics. A supply run for some private militia maybe? I turned back, ignoring the girl staring at me, and started checking the bodies for a manifest or a contact. Some credits, some hot credits, flashing with banking warnings. Weapons placed separately, blood sticky on everything. Datapad. Let's see. Deliver parts to Hart Gorma Gotzul. Take over Zamir Sapling. Deliver to. Wait. Zamir? Hart Space it is then. Ten days of nightmares, then never again. I had a plan now. What did you find? The girl asked, trying to grab the pad. I let her. She wouldn't know what the manifest meant. A weapon I replied, piling the bloody weapons into a coat, and dragging them towards the bath. Blood washes easily, madness stays forever. I started cleaning the weapons, going over each of them with the force, looking for structural defects. A blaster pistol seemed fine. Tibana gas at 80%. Energy pack full. Good for 80 shots then. Blast a rifle, about to self-destruct. We'll arrange that to be certain then. Thermal detonator, smelling of Jebrook blood. Good enough. Stunner prod, mainly used for slave entertainment. I let a trickle of energy pass through my hand and into the handle. Electric blue. Not my prey fay. Red color, but will do for substitute lightsaber. Blast a rifle, mostly functional. Fired recently and missed. I know. It was fired at me. Tibana gas at 65%. Energy pack at 80%. Good for 300 shots. Operator, download blaster technician first class I called in my mind, starting to overcharge the rifle. The force helped, expanding the nozzle of the gas chamber. 20 shots now. Should blow a hole through a plasteel wall, or even a hut. The... Oxinins didn't carry firearms, only blades, and strange ones at that. I held a pronged lance trying to figure it out. It should expand and deploy radially, another blade sprang out and almost took my head off. Great, at least I know. Alien weapons be alien. To be packed and sold along with other self-detonating weapons. I bet the huts will love them. On board a young female voice called from behind me. The Sith had so many ways to keep young ladies entertained. The Force knew them all. Maggots under the skin, electrified needles drilled into teeth, acid dripping on the eyelids. Damn it. I was getting worse. Want to eat Zabrak or Oxynon for dinner? I asked her instead. A long silence fell, then she answered meekly. You knew I was hungry. Damn your Jedi mind tricks, huh? She thought I was joking. Equals Ash hey equals. Interlude Pef. Planet Farana. Corporate Sector World slash Zinch, disputed. Oxine in meat tastes like pork. Especially when fried at 300 degrees for 30 minutes. The girl ate without complaining now. It was possibly when I started wrapping cuts and storing them in the freezer then she realized I wasn't joking. We don't waste food on this ship, young lady I told her with a fake Kuwait accent. She recoiled, almost like someone else made her eat people before. You're not a Jedi she murmured, wiping her mouth delicately. Of course not. How many others were in the program, some kind of corporate force adepts? I asked, the force screaming for revenge, back behind the vault door in my mind. I only know of one, Alessia. But she went mad and drank her therapist's blood. Clarice replied, not looking at me. The girl with platinum hair, from kindergarten. She stabbed me with a fork, here in the neck I replied pointing at the scar. I know. Wasn't my decision she said meekly. Of course it wasn't. You were five year old too. I closed my eyes and repeated my mantra. It was holding for now. But for how long? The drugs had to come from somewhere. Refined Zamir perhaps? 
being a lab rat for some military corporation sucked now. A web of events, nothing left to chance. My parents being posted here, my drugs, my friendly corporate handler, the ever harder tests. I should send the Zinsja fruit basket someday. Anyway, I had a ship now and some cargo to sell. A route to my Zamia sapling. The force did set me free. I only had to keep moving. You know, if Vale is any proof, even Sith can be great people. Do you know if you can use that battle meditation thing? Clarice asked, eyeing me with a different interest now. Hungry almost, but not for my flesh. Power. Everyone wants power. What did the Rob say? Avoid large numbers, objects in motion, stay in motion. Probably not then. My strength is my own. I told her instead. Ten days. I will not break. Half a trillion suns in this galaxy. I wanted to see them all. Experience new worlds, meet new people. Sometimes eat them. Stay in motion. As plans go, it sounded just right. I don't want to eat people. It's unseemly the girl replied, chewing on her last bits of oxynin. Poor girl, must have been really hungry. Excellent. You will learn to cook then I told her with a smile. She stared blankly at me like I was a monster. Whatever. I found her a role on my ship. Teach her to clean my clothes and repair the ship's systems. Behind every great man, there's a great woman. She even looks nice. Guess I'll keep her then. The force trembled slightly, almost like approving on my decision. Glad you're with me then, dear force. So many things to do. Come Clarice. We need to clean the blood from the cargo bay I exclaimed, in a happy voice. The girl paled, but followed me to the hold. Hmm, meat does give you plenty of energy. I wonder how huts taste. A galaxy torn asunder. Part 1. Jedi Temple. Coruscant. Two weeks ago, Obi-Wan Kenobi became the most powerful man in the galaxy. Eleven days ago, when he was to canned from a back to tank, he was appraised of that fact. It didn't take him long to figure out that his new status was a poisonous fruit. Billions of soldiers, tens of thousands ships were his to command. In that respect nothing changed, in theory anyway. Obi-Wan still was the supreme commander of the Republic military. He had the authority to save or condemn whole sectors of the galaxy. Kenobi was in a position for which many would kill for, yet all the former Jedi desired was to go back in time. Just two weeks. Was it so much to ask for? Obi-Wan sighed. Coming back to the temple was a mistake. There were ghosts here, friends and acquaintances alike, his brothers and sisters. The only family he knew before Satine. Kenobi wasn't sure if the Jedi Temple was tainted by so many people dying here or if it was just the Force playing tricks on him. The dark side reigned unchallenged and its influence was unsettling. What use was the power he held in his hands when the galaxy was so broken? The Jedi Order was for all intents and purposes gone. The lucky ones managed to flee Coruscant before Yularen's fleet arrived and locked down the whole planet. Even now, there were whole clone armies spread all over the planet either maintaining the martial law or hunting down Jedi. Even as Gar's supreme commander, Obi-Wan lacked the authority to call off Order 66. He could do anything, condemn or save whole sectors of the galaxy, but only as long as his orders didn't interfere with the hunt for the Jedi. It was Cody of all people who made that stance crystal clear. For a thousandth time, Obi-Wan cursed himself for a fool. When he found the clones on Kamino all those months ago, he should have been even more curious. I should have asked better questions, Kenobi sighed. Even now he was unaware of the full scope of the contingency orders binding his army. Cody told him all he could, though he inferred that there were at least few other orders besides 66 which could be given or stopped only by a dully elected chancellor. That was a problem. Sir, the Senate is already in session. Lieutenant Nile reported. The young clone was in charge of Obi-Wan's security detail. Kenobi looked around the huge and very empty antechamber of the Jedi Temple. There were only his clones in here and the ghosts of all the Jedi he failed. There wasn't a security detail in existence that could protect Obi-Wan from the intangible shades of the dead. Power. Obi-Wan frowned at that thought. He would never understand why people seek it. Now that he had it in spades it was more trouble that it was worth. It couldn't give him what he wanted, nor what he needed. The galaxy was still broken. The Clone Wars were far from over. The Republic itself was ready to tear itself apart. 
A pained sigh escaped Obi-Wan's lips. There were too many ghosts here. He doubted he would be visiting again anytime soon unless he absolutely had to. Satin was right, coming here was a mistake, yeah he couldn't stop himself. He simply had to face his failure. No matter what the Jedi or the clones did, Obi-Wan was the supreme commander of the military on that fateful day. It was his responsibility to stop such madness from unfolding, contingency orders or not. I'm sorry. Obi-Wan apologized to the dead. We understand, sir, Nal whispered. We'll get the bastards who escaped and avenge our brothers. Kenobi looked at the lieutenant and an expressionless helmet stared back. Yes. Obi-Wan lost many friends on the day of the coup. Brainwashed or not, the clones suffered the same. Of the battalion stationed at the temple, only ten people survived. Most of them would require a lot of replacement limbs and implants if they were to recover. Obi-Wan felt like weeping. The Sith couldn't have landed a greater blow to the Jedi if they tried. To think that the Council was to blame. Even if they were apparently right, Palpatine of all people turned out to be a Sith. Kenobi wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. Logically it was Palpatine who trained Maul and was ultimately responsible for the Naboo crisis, Qui-Gon's death and this whole war. Obi-Wan wanted to believe that was the case so much it hurt. He needed to believe that the Council had very good reason to destroy the Order and threaten to break up the Republic through their coup. There simply was no proof. Oh, Palpatine was a Sith all right. The few surviving recorded fragments of his fight with the Jedi and the Shi'ar carnage in his apartments were proof enough. However there was no proof the Chancellor had knowingly worked against the Republic. On the contrary, there were mountains of evidence surfacing that pointed at the opposite conclusion. For more than a week evidence of monstrous corruption at all levels of the Republic government were coming to light as Palpatine's dead man switches were coming online, solid evidence that was impossible to dismiss. Let's not make the Senate wait. They're too much trouble at the best of times. Obi-Wan intoned. He gave one last look to the antechamber and turned around to leave. On his way to the transport, Kenobi's mind went back to the events of the past week. Did Palpatine plan it this way, he wondered. Did the Chancellor intend to throw the Republic into chaos upon his death or was what his recording said true? Obi-Wan closed his eyes and his mind drifted back to the first data dump from Palpatine's dead man switch. Part 2. One week after Chancellor Palpatine's assassination, the holonet was taken over by another message from a deceased man. This time it wasn't a largely unknown if important government official like Director Ruler. A bit younger looking Sheev Palpatine appeared in the homes of trillions all over a public waved, then leaned forward so he could place his hands on his desk. Behind him a window showed an ordinary evening on Coruscant. My fellow citizens, I hope that this recording would serve no other purpose but a historical footnote, while we're all enjoying a better future. Palpatine smiled ruefully. However, as your Chancellor, it is my solemn duty to the Republic, to each one of you, to make sure some secrets don't die with me if misfortune befalls me. Palpatine leaned back and his expression sobered. At the time this recording is taken, I've been Chancellor for a little over one year. In that time, it's been the greatest of privileges to represent you. Sitting in this chair, seeing firsthand how the Republic works on all levels, it is a unique experience. It was eye-opening for me and I've been a Senator representing my homeworld of Naboo for years before being elected to this post. It is my solemn hope that by the time anyone views this recording, the galaxy we live in, the great Republic you elected me to serve, is a better place. The Chancellor straightened and looked into the camera with bright eyes. I hope that none of you had suffered as my homeworld did under after the Trade Federation invaded. I hope that I've been able to make the Senate the institution it is meant to be, a forum where every Republic member could come to address their grievances, come forward with their problems and find a swift and constructive solution, Palpatine sighed sadly. It is my hope that no more Republic citizens would suffer under an invader's heels. I hope no more worlds like Naboo would be abandoned while the Senate is tied up in procedures and proven useless. Palpatine looked down in shame. If you're watching this recording as anything else but a part of historical hollow, then I've failed my duty. I've failed you and I beg for your forgiveness. The Chancellor paused for a moment. When he looked up, his eyes were haunted. I can't in a good conscience let the Republic continue be the inefficient, corrupt mess I've come to know as a Chancellor. Some might say that I do it for vengeance. Because I'm from Naboo and my home was invaded. Palpatine shrugged. What of it? 
Naboo is my precious home. A sovereign member of the Republic. It was invaded. It was conquered. Palpatine stood up and pointed to the floor. The Senate ignored the plight of my people. Just like it would ignore yours if the payoff is big enough. He took a deep breath and visibly struggled to calm down. It is no baseless accusation I'm making, my fellow citizens. I've uncovered evidence of widespread ongoing corruption within the Senate. I'm not sure exactly whom I could trust in this building, much less the courts. This is why I'm making this recordings and attaching all I've found out so far. If an accident befalls me before justice could be served, then the evidence shouldn't vanish with my death. The Chancellor tapped a few buttons on the terminal built into his desk and multiple windows were projected around him. Data began scrolling down each one of them. Recorded conversations, bank statements, assorted paperwork connecting multiple senators with the Trade Federation. Ironclad proof of bribes and blackmail. Senators and corporations knowingly making deals which weren't in the best interests of either their people or the Republic as a whole in exchange of favors or various personal benefits. That was simply the first and oldest of Palpatine's dead man switches. Each year he made a new one cataloging more and more corruption, which in turn proved his fears that simply going to the courts wouldn't be enough. Their members were more often than not compromised too, either outright bought or appointed by people who were. The revelations were still ongoing. More than enough evidence had been unveiled and confirmed as real to paralyze the Republic and there were still years worth of messages waiting to fire up. Equals RK equals. Senate chamber. Senate building. Coruscant. Obi-Wan put his thoughts about Palpatine's shenanigans out of his mind for a moment and walked on the Mandalorian platform to stand beside his wife. Her security detail gave him curt nods of respect and continued to ignore him while looking for anything out of place. Are you alright? Satine activated a privacy field, cutting off the current speaker and the noise made by the rest of the senators. You were right. Obi-Wan admitted. I'm sorry. Me too. Even here. Kenobi could still feel the ghosts at the Jedi Temple looking accusingly at him. Any change? Same old, Satine sighed in exasperation. Everyone trying to cover their backsides while shoving the blame to their former friends. Obi-Wan sneered in disgust. There was a war going on. The Republic needed Chancellor, however the Senate was too busy pointed fingers at each other to seriously contemplate electing someone to the post. Only at the first session post the coup there were any real attempts to get a new chancellor in place. However, politics interfered. Bail Organa was tainted thanks to his close association with the Jedi and was gleefully rejected by a solid majority. Kuwait's representative, who was the next most likely candidate was shot down by a combination of outrage after his people refused to send help to Corellia and fear that if he was elected it wouldn't be long before he could rule as a dictator and ignore the Senate. That was even a reasonable concern because with Corellia losing most of its industry and the system itself under enemy control, nothing short than a reasonably large alliance could hope to rival Kuwait either politically or economically. In retaliation, Senator Danu ensured no one else could get enough votes to become Chancellor. The consequences were plain to see, everyone was busy denying Palpatine's accusations from beyond the grave, when they weren't cursing the man's very name. Satine, this can't go on. Until a new Chancellor countermands Order 66, my hands are tied. Obi-Wan admitted. His hands were tied. In retrospect, Yularen had gotten quite lucky with Admiral Felix at Corellia. Many of the other clones were much less reasonable as far as Order 66 was concerned. They knew that their actions were hurting the Republic, regretted the necessity, but weren't bulging. Until the Chancellor called them off, their primary mission was hunting down the Jedi and that was it. It was, insane, it was frustrating, yet Obi-Wan couldn't find a loophole that all but a handful of clones would accept. The only bright ray of hope were the various special operations units ARCs and commandos alike, who were much more reasonable. Kenobi knew that they had either arrested or extracted various Jedi and were keeping them safe until the dust settled and could be determined who was guilty and who innocent. This is your glorious republic, husband. Came Satine's deadpan response. Lock them in until they elect a new chancellor? She half joked. I'm sorely tempted. Obi Wan grumbled. At least Vale isn't here or the circus would be even worse. Any news from our glorious leader? Nothing new. I told you the last thing I heard, which isn't any different from what your people concluded. He's gone to ground with a significant part of a sector fleet and the separatists are trying to hunt him down with no luck so far. 
He'll turn up eventually. That's what I'm afraid of. Obi-Wan admitted. How deep did you look into his history, Obi? All the Jedi had. Not a good enough answer. Our tales tell of a man who doesn't shy from burning whole worlds or drowning them in blood when he deems it necessary, however he had never done it without a good enough reason, Satine whispered. You sound like you want him to come back. Kenobi sounded torn. And you're unsure what you'll do when he comes back, aren't you husband? I don't like what he does, Obi-Wan. However considering all this, Satine waved at the chamber, I'll not only welcome his return but gleefully cheer him. Mandalore is under siege and I we both know that even if a new chancellor is elected today, they might not give you leave to relieve our home. Sad but true. I'll be ordered to remove the separatists from the core before using everything in my disposal. Obi-Wan reluctantly agreed. Any ideas? Nothing you'll find acceptable or even funny.